Good afternoon, and welcome to the Alabama Advanced Virtual Seminar. I'm Paulette Patterson Dilworth, Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And I'd like to share some background with you on the Alabama Advanced Partnership for Gender Equity, which was funded in fall 2019 as part of the National Science Foundation's Advanced Program. Its aim is to increase the participation and advancement of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, otherwise known as STEM. The goals of the partnership are to implement institutional changes and practices and policies that inhibit gender equity and inclusion in STEM at partner institutions. By gender, we mean gender and related to social identity and much more. To increase the representation and visibility of women, racial, ethnic minorities, and other social identities in STEM departments by improving the recruitment, retention, and promotion practices and policies. Our partner institutions for the Alabama Advanced Program include the Alabama a and University, Oakwood University, the University of Alabama at Huntsville, and Auburn University. The COVID-19 pandemic's disparate impact on women generally, and women of color in particular, make it more urgent than ever to ensure that gender is not a barrier to economic security and opportunities in the workplace. The integrated approach of tackling the intersectional issues of gender equity is a key component of our success. This advanced goal is to promote equity, eliminate harassment, and other forms of discrimination are all important priorities. Today, in partnership with the Alabama Advance, the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and our partner institutions, we are excited to host this virtual seminar. This advanced virtual seminar will focus on implicit and ex explicit bias in science and medicine. We're excited to have Dr. Mona Fouad, who is going to be our speaker and has much to share in this area, given her background on working on minority health disparities. The advanced virtual seminar series is held monthly and will feature various speakers from UAB and surrounding advanced institutions and partners. Excuse me. Our next advanced seminar is scheduled for November 18th, 2021 at 1 p.m. And our featured speaker for that event is Dr. Cynthia Warwick, who is president of Stillman College. The underrepresentation of women, especially women of color in academic leadership and this decision-making positions will be the topic of that seminar series. Now I'd like to um, say a few words about our speaker. I don't I would I don't like the idea that people tend ten time, times to say that she needs no introduction. I think that her work speaks volumes for her. Dr. Fiord is a professor of medicine and director of the Division of Pre Preventive Medicine and serves as founding director of the UAB Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Center. She has been nationally recognized as a leader in health disparities research and is a member of the NIH National Advisory Council on Minority Health and Health Disparities. She is a PI on numerous federally funded projects that bring in more than $20 million to $51 million. Most of these fundings have a common theme of improving health and of preventing disease in minoritized communities. Dr. Piad is also the founding PI on the uh, University of Alabama Grand Challenge Project, Live Health, Healthy Alabama. Through all of these efforts, as well as by generously devoting her time to trainees that she has personally and successfully mentored, Dr. Fiad is making an enormous contribution to the next generation of leaders in the fight against health disparities. I told her that I actually counted, and I counted no less than 16 positions where she is currently serving as a senior scientist, an associate dean, a senior associate dean, or a PI. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fuad. Thank you, uh, Dr. Delworth, and you shouldn't have had this long uh, um, introduction. Uh, it makes me like feel like I'm either very old or I'm running out of breath. But thank you so much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be a speaker on this month uh, seminar series for the advance. Um, as you know, I really, really, uh, this is uh, advancing the 
the career of women is just something very, very important to me. And um, part of what I really enjoy is mentoring young women and um, to become uh, independent and leaders, especially in math and science. So I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, and you let me know if you can, you can see my screen. Uh, yes, we can see your screen. Okay, and now it, did it go to the, uh, yeah, is this in the presentation mode? Okay, thank you. And I, so I was asked to uh, speak about implicit and explicit bias in science and medicine. And I know that Dr. Dilworth and maybe and leaders, they know about this better than me, but I'm just gonna try to, just talk about the basics uh, of implicit and or ma mainly implicit uh, uh, bias, which is we call it to unconscious bias, uh, because this is something really, really very important. So I'm just going to talk first about understanding the bias, uh, just defining it and um, recognizing its impact and then how we minimize that and then uh, a summary. Uh, about that. So just, you know, like if you uh, try to search for unconscious bias, you would realize it's a really, really big topic. And you can get like thousands of articles, reports, videos, and, um, uh, and it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's exist in uh, a lot of uh, businesses, sectors, schools, universities, and unfortunately, healthcare. So um, because it, this is a topic that affects all of us, um, so we all need to be aware of it. And we for sure need to understand it because we it impacts a lot of people and impacts our work and our environment. So if we want to under, understand the explicit and implicit bias, um, so what is bias? Um, it is a tendency for all of us to have certain perception, ideology, or results. Um, it interferes with our ability to be impartial, you know, in our judgment. Uh, we can be um, and uh, uh, prejudiced by our objectives. So it is very important because you're gonna, you know, like if you think about yourself, we all have this bias in, in, in ourselves, but it just, you know, it, it really impacts all our communications and interactions with people. So what can be explicit? Can we be explicit or implicit? I just wanna talk a little bit about the explicit bias because that's really, um, a type of bias that it's ingrained in our conscious uh, is declarative. It's um, it's um, it's in our memories. Uh, conscious bias, we can say it's extreme and characterized by over being negative behavior, and it's expressed through physical and verbal. Can sometimes be like a harassment throughout more of uh, our subtle means of um, of communication. Uh, so in case of explicit uh, uh, bias, the person is very clear, uh, that's their beliefs, and uh, his or her feelings and attitudes are behaviors, you know, it's just, this is their intent. So we know that this is their belief, you know, about this bias. Um, and the opposite of the implicit bias, this is like our thoughts or feelings, uh, that are outside of our awareness, it may not really be um, aligned with the beliefs. So I may be believe in something, but I still may have this implicit bias, but my belief can be, uh, can be different. So, so we're gonna focus today on implicit bias or unconscious bias because um, explicit bias, we know we can tell that this person really uh, have some bias. So the focus of implicit bias, um, there, is, um, there is, you know, like um, most health practitioners bias at unconscious level is influenced by a lot of factors um, that maybe it's been affected by over time exposure to 
negative messages that we get in the media or certain groups that uh, came across. And um, mainly most of the research is focused on implicit bias in healthcare professionals um, and, and practitioners. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So um, it's also affected by a lot of factors, especially in healthcare. And we're gonna give examples after this, but um, it impacts like if that patient is old, is young, is disabled, uh, the, the provider can look into their education, uh, their ethnicity, um, their, if their behavior, if that person uh, have a tendency of uh, substance abuse, uh, depends on the diagnosis, like if, if a practitioner or provider see an HIV uh, patient, maybe they already have a bias about um, their lifestyle um, and maybe they, they don't have the exact really reasons under why they were diagnosed with HIV. Uh, a lot of also uh, bias is uh, insurance status, like um, providers sometimes may not uh, uh, propose or, uh, or recommend certain treatment um, if they feel like this person may not be able to access this treatment because of insurance status. Actually, obesity can be um, also another uh, factor that can impact um, a, a health practitioner's bias if they see an obese person. Uh, maybe they, they already think you know, about their lifestyle and behavior, for sure race and socioeconomic status and social orientation. So uh, I just wanted to make sure that we understand that also all of us have implicit bias. We have some degree of this bias. It doesn't mean that we are uh, bad people or we are inappropriate or discriminatory. Um, so, but we all do that. Like, um, you know, like we've been trained in medicine as a physician that um, you need to diagnose things once the person walks into your exam room. Like if you're seeing limping, if they're seeing you coughing, if there's their, uh, how they're walking, how they, you know, like, so we're already like providers and physicians and practitioners are trained to make an assessment when a person walks in. And, and in every, you know, uh, walk of life, for sure, all of us, once we see a person, we make like a perception about that person, even um, um, if I uh, if I am, you know, uh, I look different. I have a certain skin tone. Maybe I am from a different country. Uh, if I'm short, if I am uh, overweight, if I have gray hair, how I dress, if my dress looks like I am from an upper class or a lower class, like in seconds we make an assumption about this person. It could be bad, it could be good, you know, like, but it is some kind of bias. So um, if, if we can think about what creates our biases, you know, like it's our life experience. It's like our background, where we grew up, who are the, where the people around us? What are the stories that were, were told to us? What our grandparents were telling us? Who are the people that we played with? Which schools we went to? Um, so it's our experiences and our story that could shape or influence our decisions and perceptions about others. And maybe this is, you know, impact us without any conscious, like we don't feel it. Uh, you, we're fed a lot of media and a lot of story and they, sometimes the media put like a certain um, characteristics or certain groups, uh, we read stories or, you know, so, or our friends or our network um, that we interact with, they have certain uh, perception about people and we absorb that. So, so really this, the, our biases is coming from our life experience and who we interact with and who we listen to. So, so let's talk a little bit about identifying the type of implicit bias. So as I mentioned, there is that perception. 
that we tend to do, and I hinted to it a little bit about some of our demographics. Um, so for example, in, in healthcare, some providers assume that all African-American patients exaggerate their pain or get pain medications, or they don't have insurance, uh, or they don't eat healthy. Uh, they assume that women exaggerate their pain uh, because they are emotional. And actually, I can tell you this has happened to me, and this was the last time I, I, I saw that provider. I completely changed that provider after that incident. I went in for my checkup, and that provider, he examined me. And before even I left the room or put my clothes, he was dictating my case. And the first thing he dictated, he said, a patient, a female patient, aged blah, 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 paranoid about, and I heard the word paranoid, and I said, why you would say I'm paranoid? So it's just like he did not, you know, just describe my condition. And I left and never went back to this physician again. So they assume that women usually exaggerate their pain or emotion or over um, uh, complain about symptoms that they may not have. Uh, they may assume, as I mentioned, that poor uh, patients may not be uh, uh, able to get their medications or they may not be a compliant and take their medications on a regular basis. Or um, assume like a gay man may have multiple partners, not just you know one partner. So these are assumptions of perception and that's one kind of um, implicit bias. Okay, the other thing is confirmation. People that they have certain bias or all of us would like to focus on um, confirmation that, um, uh, that, that this, our, our uh, bias is confirmed by other and is believed to be true. So for example, um, if you uh, suspect that there's a patient has infection and then using um, uh, raised white, you know, like we know that, um, uh, if we have infection and we do a blood test, our white blood cells are high. So instead of looking what is really the underlying causes of this white blood cells, you know, maybe it's a defect, they just say it's an infection. So, so we tend to try to confirm our bias. Uh, the other thing is affinity bias. And this is really in the heart of diversity. It's just like, um, surrounding ourselves with people like look like us and think like us. So they have similar bias uh, and that's what make us feel like um, that this bias is not a bias, you know, like what we think is what, um, what, is, what is true. Um, so we, 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 you know, like not to share ideas uh, with different people, different gender or different nationality. We just surround ourselves with the same people like us. There's something called the halo in the horns. Like for example, like um, if we hear about a person that is just really achievers and, and that that person has achieved something um, like, or even like when we talk about people like in, um, uh, like actors and actresses, and we are very impressed with them without knowing exactly what is their personality. So we put them on a pedestal. Or what we call the horns effect, which is a tendency to other people negative if we learn something unpleasant about this person. If you can just hear, oh, you know, this person, she did that and that. We intentionally, you know, like after that, don't think uh, high about them. So, so we, we talked a little bit about the different kinds of biases, but unfortunately, this bias can make serious impact on a lot of things we do. So uh, it impacts everything we do. It impacts, as I mentioned, the services in our healthcare. Uh, and you know, like we're talking about advanced and STEM and women here, and we're gonna give some examples. It, it impacts how people select uh, hire people or even um, promote them. Um, it impacts when we are working, what assignments to give to who, because, oh, this is the person that can do it. She can't do it, you know, like um, 
uh, I, I mentioned performance evaluation, um, interactions and satisfaction is, um, and corrective actions. So this bias in the workplace or in our environment can impact an everyday uh, life. So for example, like patient services, uh, there were studies done by, uh, by Kaiser um, and they found that non-white patients receive fewer uh, cardiovascular intervention that, and fewer renal transplant. And this is documented. These are studies. I can get you the references of it. They also feel like they are less prescribed pain medications like the non-narcotic. Um, African-Americans can be more blamed for being passive about healthcare. They said, oh, they don't care about being healthy. Uh, African-American women more likely to die after being diagnosed with breast cancer because we know that uh, there is bias against um, providing them where, with screening. And also um, some African-American men are less likely, likely to receive complete, you know, like um, cancer care because of insurance status. There are certain um, um, newer drugs and or maybe being in a clinical trials, we think that African-Americans don't wanna be on those a uh, new state of the art therapeutic trials. So physicians don't offer these trials to them. So, uh, so again, as I mentioned, this is all came from the Kaiser Foundation study. And it, you can see like specifically the study showed that 14% uh, of African-Americans, 13% of Latinos were more likely to report being treated unfairly when seeking medical care uh, in the past few years compared to white. Majority of white patients um, thought that the quality of care was the same, but 23% of care was of lower quality. In the opposite, you can see that African-Americans, the majority responded that care was of lower quality and 27% said the same. So you can see that the, this is, um, you know, like um, uh, the opposite of how the perception or satisfaction of healthcare between majority white and African-Americans. Now I wanna talk about recruiting and hiring because we're talking about now advance and being in, um, uh, in, uh, in the career, you know, and this is very, very important. So even when um, employee um, try to eliminate bias, there's subtle implicit biases that, um, that we, um, we have in the, from the workplace for job selections. So for example, in, in this case, um, researchers were um, uh, developed four resumes uh, for job applications with white sounding names and, uh, or African-American sounding names. And approximately 5,000 resumes were submitted to companies advertising the same job opening in uh, Boston and Chicago newspapers. So they found out that applicants with the white sounding names received 50% more calls back uh, with equally qualified applicants African -American, uh, than African Americans names. So this is bias in selection based uh, on just the names. So uh, the other thing too that some researchers found in what we call the motherhood um, uh, and the motherhood penalty. And this is, you know, another study that was done that they found that um, there was like about over like at close 200 participants were both men and women evaluated pairs of equally qualified job applicants who were in the same sex and race, but different on parental status, like women that they have uh, children versus women that they don't. When they looked and assessed the pairs of women judged as uh, mothers where uh, they said they are less committed, uh, they don't have time for their job, they may be uh, less competent, and they were very, you know, much less recommended than the non-mothers uh, for these jobs. Also, mothers, uh, when mothers were recommended for hire, the recommended salary was um, close to 7% lower than the non-mothers. Um, and we know that when we re re interviewing 
women, we can't ask about children, we can't ask about pregnancy status, but if, if the interviewer knew about that, they um, unconsciously felt like this person may not have enough time to devote to her job. So we call that motherhood penalty. In the opposite, there is what we call fatherhood uh, bonus. Like when, when, they, when a man is applying for a job, um, they found that the one that have a family and they're gonna be spending on the family and taking care of family, uh, they were more committed to their careers than the non-fathers. And more fathers were recommended for higher than non-fathers in, uh, in their salaries. They felt like they are responsible for, and they're gonna be, um, and they're taking care of a family, which is opposite to the motherhood penalty. So um, also, you know, like they, they looked at, um, um, they reviewed 300 letters for recommendations and they found that women would get shorter letters, min minimum assurance, uh, rather than solid recommendations. The letters were less focused on candidates record of accomplishments and twice likely to have gender terms like, oh, she's intelligent, she's a young lady, She's an insightful woman. You know, like when, when they reviewed the hiring of men, they didn't use the gender terms uh, when they used that. And, and also, um, instead of using young lady or insightful woman, they use excellent, superb, uh, hardworking, uh, careful, um, uh, versus careful and meticulous, you know, so it is more of the ability versus the effort. For men, it was the ability and for the women was the effort. Uh, when a woman, you know, like um, applying, there is more doubt raised. You know, she worked hard on the projects she accepted. Uh, significantly more likely to uh, reference personal life, those were women. But when they looked at men, more focus on CVs, they're more focused on their publications and their patents. So you can see that for men, they looked at the quality and for women, they looked at more of the efforts of, of a woman and her work. So we can see that this is unconscious bias that may um, really impact accomplishments and undervalued uh, of women in, in the workplace. Now, also, uh, when, when they look at evaluation, promotions, consumptions, there's assumption that uh, possible family responsibilities may affect the candidate career path. And um, we, we looked at some uh, study here we did um, at UAB to look at the advancement of women and URM uh, in their career. And what we heard from uh, majority male that they said they don't want to be in a leader position. You know, like, so did, did you ask them? Um, you know, are they willing to accommodate their circumstances because they have kids and be a leader? You know, they, are, they, they already assume that women, that they have responsibility, don't wanna be uh, in a leadership position. And then there is this assumption of a female or URM candidate that is not gonna fit. Like um, I was talking to a chair of one of the departments of medicine, and we're trying to increase the uh, diverse um, uh, applications and hiring in our residents. And he came to me and he complained about the other residents that was giving the, him feedback about a candidate. And this candidate was gonna be the only African-American and a woman in this specialty. And what the other residents told him, Oh, you can't hire her, she's not gonna fit. So what it means is not gonna fit. Instead of we create an inclusive environment. Um, so, um, so we don't know about how, how people are developing their, uh, their, their career, but these are all assumptions. Again, you know, like uh, continue in evaluation and promotion, women and URM scholars may be subject to higher expectations. And I hear this a lot uh, from our URM and women, and, and actually for me too, coming from a different culture. You feel like um, 
people are expecting you to do more, that you have to prove yourself every day. The majority, they don't have to do that, um, but, but you have to do more and they put you on a higher bar because their expectations that you're not as good as the majority. Uh, so the work and idea findings for women or members of your M groups may be undervalued or may not be fairly attributed to, um, uh, to your work and collaboration and, and, and evidence. So the competence and ability of women and URM scholars to run a research group may be um, doubtful or underestimated in, in, in a majority environment. And that's why I hear this a lot. I have to prove myself every day. Now I'm just gonna show you uh, an example of um, um, that there were review of memos of just a hypothetical, um, uh, this was a third year litigation um, associate uh, memos that had 22 identical errors. And half of the partner, um, half of the partner reviewers were told author were, were, was African American and half were told authors were um, uh, was Caucasian. So that's what they said about these memos. So uh, they are equal in everything, give the same names, the same seniority, their, um, their, uh, uh, their school education in the same school. The only thing we change if they are African Americans or Caucasian. So for African American, um, they rate them 3.2 out of five as of uh, overall. For Caucasian, they were uh, evaluated as 4.1 out of five, and everything else is the same. Uh, number of spelling grammars, they picked up 5.8 out of seven for African American, and they only picked 2.9 out of seven for Caucasian. Okay, then when um, they looked also, again, these are the same schools, the only thing that uh, African American Caucasian for overall comments. Um, for African Americans, they say they need a lot of work and they can't believe uh, this person went to NYU, you know, like how come this person went there, you know, a lot of work uh, to a, a prestigious uh, university like NYU. Um, and their rating is average at best. Okay, when they looked at the Caucasian, they said, oh, generally this is a good writer, but needs work, uh, on, uh, on you, know, the, you know, how they're gonna write these memos. But instead of saying that um, um, needs a lot of work, they said that person has potential and good analytical skills. So you can see the, the bias here because they know that this is um, a white person versus African-American because there is a perception that African-Americans don't have the high quality of work like Caucasian. So, Everything is the same, the same seniority, the same grades, the same school, but that's how people um, uh, evaluated uh, those memos. So I think what is, every, what is really important now, what we're gonna do about it? How can we minimize our own, um, uh, our own bias? So the first thing is we need to, again, acknowledge all of us have some bias. So how can I replace my self-image and be as an objective person and recognize and accept that? You know, so the first thing is accept that you have some bias. Nobody can say, oh, I don't, you know, everybody has some sort of bias. And, uh, and understand that it's usually triggered inside us, you know, like um, our brain making this judgment and we can sometimes be in a hurry and we don't think uh, before we make our perception or decisions um, or uh, preferences towards or against something. So we need to acknowledge first that we have this bias. Um, so so if we can, it, you know, like just believe that we, the, you know, like unconscious bias can be um, can be changed. We can address that. So we change them by becoming aware, as I mentioned, that this affect our decision. 
especially people like in um, that they hire people, they oversee people, they evaluate them, they assign work to them, or if they treat patients, you know, so we know that is gonna affect our decision. What kind of treatment I'm gonna give that person? Um, so, so we have to consciously override the bias. So the bias is unconscious, but we have to have the intention to try to override that. And it's good to understand what are our biases. Uh, and there are some tools and instruments to that. There's some we're gonna talk about, the Harvard one, but. If uh, you know Dr. Paulette Delors and her office has some of these tools, it'd be good for all of us. It's good to, to take those tests and know which areas your bias is is in. Um, and and that's you know as also change how we associate what makes us associate us you know to get this unconscious bias. So, so the other thing, as I mentioned, which is taking a deliberate actions and be intentional is to reduce our conscious bias um, as we interact with others at work can be accomplished by creating a standard process like collect and review data. So what is the pros and the cans? Uh, adjust our perspective to see things from another person's point of view. Um, try to focus on seeing people as individuals and not as a stereotype. Um, like, you know, like it's not that if, if I see um, uh, an overweight patients in my clinic, I would say, oh, they have bad behavior. Maybe there is a disease underlying this. Um, or if um, you see someone that um, uh, smoking, you think that, oh, this person is... Um, have really uh, other bad life, you know, as a drinker and associate other things with it. Um, and try to develop some standard procedure and, and process for evaluation. How I'm gonna evaluate this? Don't rush into judgment. Um, take time for assumptions, reflect on your biases. And we need to slow down a little bit when making a decision. We need to think of a person as an individual. Like if I'm hiring a person or I'm treating a patient, I need to take out all the biases um, from my, um, uh, my head or my brain and start to think about underlying causes of this person as a person, uh, not a woman or a man or an old or a young. So as I mentioned, it would be great if we take this Harvard implicit bias test. It really reveals a lot. And you can see here that uh, from this data, 75% have an implicit preference for white people over black people. You know, like this is, you know, something that they took the test. 76% more readily associate males with career and females with family. 76% uh, have a preference for people without a disability. These are results of these, some of these tests. And you won't know your biases unless you really test them and then you can look at them and say, oh, I, I need to work on these areas. So I'm just gonna be in, um, conclude here, but, and I don't know if we're gonna have time for discussion how this um, seminar works, but I'll be glad to answer questions. So as I mentioned, um, moving forward, um, we need to understand that implicit bias is universal everybody. And it doesn't mean that, uh, I am a bad person if I have it, uh, but it's very important to recognize its negative effect on people, especially if I'm delivering care of, or I am addressing students, or I'm hiring people, or making judgment of interactions uh, in, in social environment, or talking to, some, to people about a person. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned, start thinking about what is your biases, take some tests to, to know they are, and try to make an effort to be inclusive. Um, like for example, when, when I first came in and people know that I am from Egypt, they, they you know, some people, they said, you know, like, do, you, do you people drive cars there? Do they, you know, like uh, what kind, how you raise your, your kids, you know, like, are you not allowed to do this or allowed? So people make, make some assumptions 
without trying, try to know the person in front of you. Uh, and again, um, I want you to take those takeaway points. Explain bias is a conscious thing. And unfortunately, there's some people do that. And But this is actually, you know them. Mm -hmm. Implicit bias is unconscious and it's actually more dangerous than the explicit bias because we don't see it and we don't know it. Um, there's various type of, of bias and really it can impact healthcare. It can be changed. So it's not that we can't change it. And um, understanding our own bias is a first step for us to be able uh, to change it. So I this concludes my presentation and I'm gonna stop sharing and see if um, there is discussions or any questions. Sure. Thank you so much, Mona. That was a great, very thoughtful um, presentation. And as I listened to you, it took me back to, I think maybe the, hmm, a week or two after I'd arrived. And by the way, for those of you who do, do not know, Dr. Fiat um, co-chaired the search committee that hired me here at UAB. I'm so glad we did. Yeah, so thank you for that. But um, I remember having a conversation with you um, about your own experiences when you first arrived in the US. And I've often marveled, uh, like when I read your bio in preparation for today and thought about that story that you shared with me and how you actually got started because you came here um, just as, I guess, prepared as your husband. And I think it would, they would have characterized it back then as a trailing spouse, which we don't use that language anymore. So could you talk a little bit about that and how, what sort of helped you frame the decision that regard, despite that encounter, that it was important for you to establish your own um, identity as a scientist and all the other things that you've accomplished. So, so it, it is unfortunate and I hope that all the, the young women and uh, starting their career don't have to go through what we have done and I'm sure you have your story to sure, absolutely. let uh, in, in our place but um, so he you know like and unfortunately a lot of people have similar story like mine you know like here's my husband was recruited and I am here and I tried to get a job and either you're overqualified, underqualified, or you're not from this country, you don't know the culture. And even one person said, you're not a man one time to me uh, that to get this job, you know, at that time they were actually mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, explicit mm -hmm. bias. They can say mm -hmm. that this is right. was in the, in the late eighties, early nineties. And people were saying things that now even if they have it in their mind, they don't say it. But uh, I think it was um, a decision that, um, that I have to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have a job. And, and this builds a resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure you hear that from a lot of our URMs and women. You just either you give up or you prove yourself and you have resilience and you accept whatever is given to you. Like at the beginning, um, they only hired me a uh, volunteer. They didn't pay me. I just wanted people to know that I can talk, I can work like right. them. Um, and then after working volunteer for uh, a while, and at that time I had an MD and a master in public health. It's not that I didn't finish my, my, my study. Then uh, they said, oh, the only job we have is uh, a research assistant with a staff. I said, mm -hmm. okay. You know, like I'll work anything just to prove that um, I can do the job. And just, I, I had to take every job given to me. And then after I, I worked, you know, like as a research assistant for $5 an hour or whatever, yeah, you know, sure. I still have that letter that they gave me. Um, and my salary was $17,000 annually. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, um, People started to look at me. I was a, I, I just did whatever job they gave me. Mm -hmm. If I need to call people to show up at the clinic, if I need to write the reminder card, if I need even at that time there were projectors to carry that projector for the professor to go and give the lecture. Sure. Yeah. Till that professor mm -hmm. got 
uh, stuck in a snowstorm and couldn't come to do the lecture, they looked at me and said, can you do it? <laughs> and, and I said, I could have got scared, but you always do have people that support you. Mm -hmm. I had another woman that was working with me mm -hmm. and she said, Mona, you can do this lecture. And she took me to her house and she said, you practice. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow morning, you're going to do this. Yeah. So there is someone that took me to give me the opportunity and gave me the confidence. And once I did that, they said, oh, she can do this. She can do a hypertension lecture, you know, like she can do that. So you don't have to go through this, but I'm just saying that these, um, these situations build some resilience yes. and some persistence that I wanna succeed. I, I'm gonna do whatever, I'll give whatever to do it, but you don't have to go through this. I think we have now programs like Advance. We have offices like your office, Dr. Will Delworth, that helps people. We have mm -hmm. mentorship programs. Take advantage of these things. Yes. Uh, and we've, we have the commission status of women. We have women groups. So at, at our time, we didn't have that. Yeah. You actually mentioned something that I found I find very um, useful, and that is women supporting women. Well, you mentioned the breakthrough moment where that other woman who was there said to you, Mona, you can do this. Do you find that to be um, a bit lacking these days? I, I sometimes sit in spaces where it seems that people see this whole workplace effort as a very competitive space and that we are always competing with each other as opposed yeah. to support, being more supportive to overcome what traditionally is some male dominated spaces that women have to learn yeah. how to do that more, better. I I think it's yes and no. Uh, and I can say that again, every um, every like point in my career where I got helped, uh, I got helped actually by men and women, you know, mm -hmm. but women too helped me a lot. You know, like, you know, when I was um, in the division preventive medicine as an associate professor, I had a division director that was a woman and, um, she, she helped me when I wanted to apply for promotion and the promotion committee said, no, 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 don't put her. She said, Mona, do you want to go for it? I'll support you. So I did that. When my, my compensation was completely lower than the other men in our division, she pushed to get me some um, uh, equity. So that, that's, that was a good thing. So if you find someone like that, work with them. You need to find a sponsor and advocate for you. But sometimes also they can be men. Like I had someone like Dean Vickers that I worked with. He's the one who um, helped me and um, sponsored me for awards or the National Academy of Medicine put my name. You know, he could have put anybody's name in the whole university. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so for him to select me for that and feel that I deserve this. So find it can be a woman, it can be a man, but find that person is not a mentor, is a person that can be your advocate and your sponsor and your cheerleader to work with you. And I hope that the same way they do for you, you do for others. This doesn't mean that there's some competitiveness. Yes, yeah. but get away from those. Right. Look for, uh, for the ones that they could help you. Yeah. You've actually also opened another... Um idea is how do we um i don't want to use the word educate but what is it that um we should insist that men particularly men in leadership roles do in terms of demonstrating their uh, efforts to be allies or accomplices or disruptors when it comes to creating spaces where women feel that they belong and can thrive in whatever profession they choose. Yeah, I think, I think Dr. Delworth, this is very important. I don't know if you can educate that, but sometimes it's what we talked about, the unconscious or implicit bias. Some of them may not realize that they're doing that and just open their eyes. 
you know, look, you know, like you're ignoring these women that in your department. Um, we started uh, several years ago to do a reception, a celebration of women promoted to associate and uh, professors. And we invite every chair to present the accomplishments of the women that promoted. And I saw how that shares as if this is the first time to realize, you know, this person and while, while they're reading their, their accomplishments, uh, they realize how much this woman did. And the woman too, for the first time, hear her chair talking about that. And the second year became a competition, how long that chair can really talk about uh uh his uh his faculty sure. uh and now we try to tape it so they don't go over the two minutes but i think things like that to make the chairs aware that you have scientists here for, you know that they work and they very accomplished they publish like i mentioned they don't look at the publications in the science they look and say oh she's working very hard mm -hmm. oh she comes you know and she doesn't take that much time off sure yeah. uh, uh there is one question in the chat that um, I'd like to share with you. We are actually nearing the end of our, our time together, but the question the, the participant asked, how do you go about having those difficult conversations with coworkers and leadership when you recognize implicit bias? I think you have to learn to have this conversation, you know, and how to go about that, because sometimes maybe you can just withdraw and be passive but you're always going to feel like you're mistreated or you feel like you're not getting what you, you, you deserve. Either you can have a frank conversation, say, you may not, but, but just start with it. You know, like, it's not like you did this to me. And just have a conversation, say, you may not realize mm -hmm. that you, uh, when you talked about this or give me that, that this was not, you know, like, you know, you assume that because I'm a woman, I did that. Just give them room that they they don't, this is unconscious and the conversation or bring in some ally to talk with you. And, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Dilworth, you can give even a better advice. But if you ignore it, you're always gonna be feeling um, that you've not been treated fairly and you're gonna carry this with you. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, one of the positions that I take, especially with young women that I mentor, is that um, if you don't take anything away from this relationship, the understanding that I need you to learn how to become your own best advocate. Yes. Because there is no one who's going to advocate for you if you can't speak up for yourself, you know, and I I had to learn that. Yes. And, uh, so I, it I was... don't do it well, but, you know, like we all <laughs> learn it to do that. But I can just say to you, to just have a social network. You know, Absolutely. like we all help each other and reach out to us, you know, like I'm, I'm sure you do, Dr. Dilworth and me. And we, if we, if we don't know the right person, we connect you with somebody. Absolutely. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to give you the last few minutes, uh, Dr. Fuad, to sh any closing thoughts that you have or any parting um, comments that you'd like to make um, um, as we close out. I just want to say, don't you ever give up. And, and have confidence yourself. If you are where you are and in this program, you have achieved something. You're already successful. So always have confidence to continue. Don't let anyone make you feel less of who you are. That's, that's very important. Thank you. And as I mentioned, our um, next um, event is scheduled for November 18th. Our speaker for the next uh, symposium is Dr. Cynthia Warwick, who is the president of Spelman, I'm sorry, Stillman College. And her topic is uh, the underrepresentation of women and especially women of color in academic leadership roles. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Fiad, for- I wanna thank <laughs> you for inviting me. Oh, this is absolutely. a privilege. Absolutely. And I want to, I, I really appreciate you spending time on a Friday afternoon with us. I know your schedule is really very busy. No, um, you're all and, too. Busy. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for, for, for sharing the spotlight with us today. I want to say thanks to Ashley Aldrich and Holly Holiday Jones, who also, it's been a, bu a busy day because today was homecoming among other yes. things. Everybody was sort of doing double duty, but thank you all. And thank you to our 
participants for hanging in there with us today. Have a Thank good you. evening and have a great weekend. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.